I'd like to call to order the meeting for Bedford Township, the town hall meeting. Please stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> okay, I'll be, I'll be real brief. Um, first of all, thank you everybody for being here tonight. Um, I want to give a big thanks to Trooper Tressa Duffin for being here. Um, she has a passion um, for this unbelievable uh, catastrophe we have going on in this world with sex trafficking. So I appreciate her uh, in that area. But let me, I wanted to give a quick little backstory of how uh, we've gotten to this point in Bedford Township to where she's here is I was at Leadership Monroe and listened to Trooper Trussa speak and it just it just tugged at my heart to that I need to do more about it here to bring awareness into Bedford. Um, so that's why we're here, um, you know, to bring awareness to the township and to um, let people know that they need to be aware what's going on right here in our backyard. Toledo is number one, Michigan is number two. Um, so I don't want to take it lightly, but I'm going to introduce at this time Trooper Tressa Duffin, and then we have two more panelists after her that'll finish off speaking. So Trooper, the floor is yours. Thank you. I'm just going to give everybody kind of a little Human Trafficking 101 class today. Um, so we'll just go over some stuff because some people don't understand what it is, perhaps, um, might not recognize it, uh, and, but we need to understand that it is here in our neighborhoods. Uh, it's in our schools, it's in our churches, it's, it's everywhere. Um, and even though this particular uh, presentation is more talking about the sex trafficking, we have to understand that labor trafficking still exists and a lot of times far exceeds this, the sex trafficking as far as the numbers go. But we don't recognize it as, as much as we do the sex trafficking. Basically, it's a form of modern day slavery. And it, we really have more slaves in the world today than we've ever had in any other time in our history. But we have to stop thinking about slaves like the ones that were chained and bound and whatever else. Not that people can't be in that, in that realm right now. But a lot of them are controlled. I guess you can kind of think of human trafficking as like domestic violence and steroids. This person is going to be controlled through a lot of the same ways a domestic violence person is. It's through the, uh, the abuse, through the verbal, through whatever else. Um, but a lot of other ways we get controlled are through the drugs. We have an addiction. That's our vulnerability right there. So somebody may take advantage of us that way because I need that particular prescription or that pill or that drug or whatever else it is. Um, that's my addiction and that's if I want that then I might go do something else for it. So we, we, we are vulnerable and that's what these guys prey on, guys and girls prey on. Basically it's a market-based economy that exists on supply and demand. And obviously we need to figure out how to get rid of some of that demand. And we need to start calling it what it is. Um, we'll talk a little bit about prostitution later on and why we think that's acceptable. You might say, oh, that person's just a prostitute. Well, that person often is trafficked. They're not a prostitute. They don't choose that life. And we need to start, I mean, all of us, law enforcement, prosecutors, general citizens need to understand that those people don't choose that life. More often than not, they are forced into that life. So we have about 100,000 to 200,000 of our own United States children in the life of trafficking right now in the United States. It's an estimate. Again, we don't really know when we see statistics a lot of times. We don't know. Um, how do I count you? If you are forced to have um, sexual relations with somebody 10, 15, 20 times a day, do I count you as a victim once or 10, 15, or 20 times? Um, so when we see the statistics, we have to be very careful because uh, we don't know. Our state is set up pretty prime for being high ranking because we have casinos and we have you know the strip clubs and we have I-75 and I-94 and an international border. We have large university areas. We have a lot of places where people come for their summer vacations and all that stuff. You don't have to have a large city to have human trafficking. I can tell you right now that uh, the Human Trafficking Coalition and the Human Trafficking Response Team and a couple council friends of mine, we're working with seven survivors right now in, in Monroe County. And those are only the people that have come forward and identified themselves as survivors. And there's still a lot of people that don't know that they're victims of human trafficking. So we need to understand that they, not, they might not recognize that um, in themselves for 10, 20, 30 years. So again, be careful with statistics. It involves the act of recruiting or transferring or transporting or harboring somebody through forced water coercion. And anybody can be a trafficker and anybody can be a victim. So I want you to understand that it's, it's not just a, a creepy, scary person. 
Um, it's not somebody that's dressed in those pimp costumes like they're represented in movies and whatever else. They can be men and women, they can be boys and girls, they can be grandparents, they can be whatever. Um, so we have to start looking at, okay, this person that's 15 years old could be a trafficker. Not just, again, that creepy person that's, that scares us. Force, like I said, one can spend a lot of time on force, it's pretty obvious. You're beating, slapping, sexual assaults, confinement, those kinds of things. Fraud, false promises, lying about wages, lying about a better life. You know, you, you're, you're falling on some hard times, you've got family to feed, you got whatever else. I got this great job. This job is gonna, you know, you can make this much money and you can have a house like this and a car like this and I'm gonna make it sound like it's a great thing. And then when you get there, you don't realize obviously that now all this money that you're making is obviously going to somebody else. Coercion, pretty much again what it, what it says there. Threat of serious harm, uh, threat of abuse of legal uh, processes, creating dependencies, establishing quotas. I may, there might be somebody that's, that has papers um, that may be here legally on visas and whatever else, but I take those. So I'm controlling them because I have their papers. I have their identification. It could be one of us. I take your driver's license if you're old enough to have one. Again, I'm controlling you because I own your paperwork and you're gonna do something to get that back. How are you gonna prove who you are when you can't prove who you are because you don't have that identification? How do people become victims? About 3% of them are kidnapped. So when we saw the movie Taken, that was kind of a good start, but it makes people think, okay, people are taken from here and, take, and shipped over there. Does that happen? Yes. But not as often as we think. About 35% are sold into trafficking by their own family members. Could be a brother, sister, could be mom, dad, could be aunt, uncle, um, it could be anybody else. So that person could be living right next to you and, have, and be trafficking their child, or trafficking their sibling. Um, and about 62% are, are, are tricked by that older boyfriend or it could be a best friend. It could be a girl too. Um, so we don't really know. There's, there, I see with the trafficking survivors that I have worked with, I would say more of them were tricked by a boyfriend, um, but there were quite a few that I've also worked with that it, we, one was sold by their mother, one was sold by a sister, and like her husband, and I've seen other, other ways that these people have been trafficked. So we have to understand that it exists in many, many ways. Where is it found? Basically, you know, where is it not, right? It's everywhere. Again, when we start to think about the labor trafficking, think about the door-to-door -door sales. When these kids come to your house and they're selling whatever they're selling, candy, cookies, whatever, a lot of times these kids are being trafficked. They're being forced to go out every day and sell X number of dollars of whatever and they can't come back to their traffic until that's, that's completed. What about the people on the side of the road that are saying we'll work you know, for money, right? These people sometimes are often trafficking victims also. You know, have you ever tried to bring any of them like food and they get mad at you and you wonder why? Well, that's kind of rude. Well, food's not gonna do them any good bringing the food back to the trafficker. They need money. So sometimes it's right in our faces and we don't see it. So they are, they are in, in way more places than we think that they are. Some scary facts, 90% of children are trafficked for sexual purposes are American children. Every two minutes, somebody becomes a victim um, of sexual exploitation, which is, leads to your vulnerability, right? Every 30 seconds, another person becomes a victim of human trafficking. And with 48 hours of a child being on the street, one in three will be approached by a trafficker. Social media, we'll talk about that in a second, but social media, if it can be, a child can be trafficked within 24 hours of coming in contact with a trafficker on social media. So it's, it's pretty quick when somebody, they, have to, they could take the time to groom you and all those other things too, but you could go out and meet them and be, and be trapped into that life right away. Some other scary facts, each child serves between 100 and 1,500 clients per uh, year. Again, I'm gonna tell you, you're gonna make me X number of dollars, $800, $1,000, whatever it is, per day. So if you don't make that quota, then obviously there's consequences. You're gonna get beaten, you're gonna get food taken away, you're gonna get, something else is gonna happen. Uh, there's, there's gonna be consequences. An estimated 30,000 victims of sex trafficking uh, die each year from AIDS, abuse, torture, all that stuff. You know, they, they're, their pimp's gonna kill them or trafficker's gonna kill them. Uh, their, their John, the person that's buying the sex, could kill them. They could kill themselves. Um, but they could also get some other diseases. Uh, and, and, and if they're heroin users or needle users, obviously they're gonna get some potential disease, diseases from that too. The average life expectancy of a child trafficked is seven years. We are seeing, I have seen statistics before where they've said, eh, the age of onset for somebody to get into this trafficking life or where I as a trafficker want to take you, used to be like 11 to 13, now we're seeing it a little higher, uh, maybe that 14 to 16, but it doesn't mean that none of us in this room can be, cannot become a victim. It's whatever circumstance brings us there. 
Um, like I said, we, we maybe we lose our house, we lose our, lose our job, we've got bills to pay, we've got things to, you know, that we have to take care of in, in our families. Again, maybe I have a drug, drug addiction or something else. That's going to be my vulnerability. So what is that vulnerability that allows me to find you and bring you into this life? Some warning signs of a victim, maybe some unexplained absences from school. Uh, maybe they can't attend school. They chronically run away from home. Sometimes I don't think we ask enough questions, even as law enforcement. Why is this person running away from home so much? What, what, what is happening to them at home that makes them leave? You know, sometimes maybe we just well, believe the parent's story or whoever's story that they're staying with. We don't talk to the kid enough. We, don't, we just don't ask enough questions. But then again, if that is being either sexually assaulted or trafficked at home, they're probably not going to tell us either. Because a lot of these victims, they suffer from PTSD. And they have Stockholm Syndrome. So they fall in love with their captor or their trafficker. But what if it's a family member? They probably already love their mom or their dad or their aunt or their uncle, right? So it's going to be really hard for them to come forward. They may have sudden changes in behavior and material possessions, and that's the one I kind of key on when I'm talking to kids. Pay attention to your friends. What's normal? They normally have this item or that item, but now all of a sudden they have a coach purse, and they've got the latest and greatest iPhone, and they're getting tanning and nails and hair, and where's this coming from? You know, somebody's obviously grooming them and buying them things and giving them things. And that might be something that you, as a child, could pay attention to somebody else, you know, your friends. Obviously, we talked about the drug addiction. There could be injuries, just like in a domestic violence situation. You're going to have the, the bruises where somebody maybe grabs them in the arm, maybe chokes them, that kind of thing. Uh, they might not have a lot of possessions. They may wear the same clothes, especially if you're seeing them in the same area. They may have the same clothes on multiple days. They don't have a wardrobe. They don't have places to go. So you're going to see them a lot of times in the same kind of clothes that, they, that you see day after day after day. Um, they're going to not have eye contact with you because having eye contact with a trafficker is a bad thing. There's consequences for that. So you may ask them a question and they're going to look down. They're not going to talk to you. They fear any authority figure. They fear law enforcement because their trafficker tells them we're bad. And they're not going to help you. So they isolate them to make them feel like the only person that's going to ever take care of them is this trafficker. And sometimes um, they might move into a home with another group of girls. Um, sometimes they call that a stable when one guy has more than a group, one, you know, one or two girls with him. Sometimes they call themselves wife-in-laws because a lot of times we are all being trafficked by the same trafficker and we may have kids in common, we may, whatever. So this becomes their family. This becomes their nucleus and that's what they, that becomes their normal. Um, so they don't want to leave that either. Some reasons why teens are at risk. Normal sexual desires, curiosity, vulnerability to flattery, um, attention seeking or affection, because a lot of times we're not getting it at home, right? And you really don't want your child for the first time to hear from some stranger, you're very beautiful. You have beautiful eyes. I like the way you wear your hair. I like the way, I like the way whatever. We don't want, we need to be telling our kids that now because we don't want that somebody else, that stranger, to be the first one that says that because they might just be like, really? And then I know it was the bad guy, and it was the trafficker that I got gotcha. you. You're obviously craving that affection, and you're not getting it, so I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to make it, you know, make you believe that I am in love with you. We're going to get married. Whatever the scenario is, I'm, I'm going to sell you. And the internet. Talked a lot about some social media, and I think you'll be hearing about some social media later on. But our kids, that's where our kids are. You know, we don't have to worry so much about the kids being taken at malls, taken off the streets, and whatever else, because the traffickers are smart. They're as smart as our kids are, and they're going where the kids are. And where's that? On the apps, on the Facebook, on the Twitters, on the whatever. They're getting recruited off of those sites. So we need to be paying better attention to what's going on around us. Some children are vulnerable because they have abuse at home. Um, some prior to being prostituted or trafficked, 57% of the girls reported being raped by somebody outside of their family, 30% by somebody within their family, and 14% somebody inside and outside. That's about 44% for boys. Because in the sex trafficking industry, it's about 80% women and girls. And it'd be about 20% boys and men. So men and boys can also be victims of sex trafficking. Where do they recruit? Where don't they recruit, right? But like I said, their number one place is social media. We make it, the kids make it easy. Because for some reason, and I, I always tell the kids, okay, go tell that stranger outside all, all your information, your name, your address, your phone number, your birthday, your family, all this other stuff, and they'll go, well, no, I wouldn't do that. But why do you do it every day on the Internet? You give that information away all the time, whether it's intentionally or not. You're telling people a lot of things about yourself because you trust that, and I don't know why you trust that because I can be anybody I want to be on the other side of that, that keyboard. So we need to really be reiterating that with our kids. 
So obviously we've already talked about that lover boy approach, that older boy maybe um, courting a younger girl, again trying to get her into that life. Tattooing, obviously what am I, what am I doing when I tattoo you? I'm branding you, right? I'm showing ownership, possession. Because that's really all you are to me is possession. You're a commodity to me. You're not a human being. You're something that makes me money. I found this on the internet, I thought it was interesting. There's a gentleman named Steve McDaniel who ran a prostitution and a drug ring and he had a female accomplice. He was going out of town. So he wrote her a little note about how to take care of the girls. Make sure you own their minds, bodies, and souls. Always make them need you and depend on you so you have power over them because power is control. Sounds like domestic violence, right? Make them understand that you don't need them and that they need you and they are replaceable. Don't let them know your plans, but always try to know theirs. No matter how much you like or care for any one of them, don't trust none of them. So this is what he's saying about the girls that he's taking care of. Lots of money, big money. I can make about $300,000 a year selling one person. So that's why it's, it's, it's open to everybody. Anybody that wants to be a trafficker, like I said, grandmas, grandpas, mom, dads, whatever. I can make a lot of money selling, selling people. Third largest commodity in the United States, and it's the fastest growing criminal industry in the world right now. It's approximately $32 billion a year, which is more than Google, Nike, and Starbucks combined. And in the United States, $18.9 billion. So this is a, there's a lot of money to be made here. Why do victims stay? Mostly this next slide. Fear. They fear retaliation, fear of incarceration, fear of the unknown. They don't trust the system. They don't know the system. Where can I get help? Some of these people might have been trafficked and have never gotten any identification, and they don't have any. So how are you going to walk in to get a driver's license or an ID card when you can't prove who you are? How are you going to get a job? Unfortunately, a lot of these people, a lot of these victims have been arrested multiple times, and not just for prostitution or solicitation. It could be for stealing. It could be for you know, survival on the streets. So they're going to have criminal records, so it's going to be very hard for them to get jobs. You know, so there's a lot of things that we need to fix. You know, some of them could have been held in captivity, because there, there are st some of that still, and it wasn't all that long ago that there was a woman that was found in Detroit that at home in the living room had a pole, and she was chained to it with a dog collar. So that does ex exist here today too, but a lot of it is, is the mind control and the abuse and everything else. We misidentify them as teen prostitutes. There is no such thing as teen prostitution. I mean, it doesn't exist. There's not a law that says, okay, well, she's a teen prostitute. So these are all her booking photos. This young lady was from Toledo. So she's getting arrested. And understand, clearly, if she gets arrested, is she going to tell me the truth? Is she going to tell me who she is, how old she is? She's going to lie, right? She's going to lie. She doesn't want to get in trouble. But clearly, you can see, yeah, I think even in that first picture, you can kind of see she's starting to have a, like, nobody's home look. But as we go on, she's clearly drug addicted and being abused. So again, why, is this, why do we say she's just a prostitute? Do you really think she wants to do this? I certainly don't. This is Grace, Grace at 15 and Grace at 17, two months before she died. Again, these are all Grace's booking photos. So again, we are arresting the prostitutes and not arresting the Johns, which we, we need to start doing that, you know, and making some of these victims more survivors and thrivers. This is a snapshot. I had did two of these uh, every year. The FBI runs a sting. All, they call it cross country. It goes all the way across the country. Every entity that, that's involved, uh, we have a SEMTAC um, group here. In 2015, um, it's a three or four day sting. We rescued 19 juveniles and we arrested 17 traffickers and two were female. In 2016, you see the six victims were uh, rescued. 10 traffickers were arrested. 46 adults were temporarily, we take them into custody, take them back to um, a, a safe place and ask them, do you need help? Do, are you being trafficked? Do you have a, a trafficker? Do you need services? Do you have a child? And we have all those things right down the hall. So if they want to get out of that life, they have the opportunity. But a lot of these ladies will go back and they'll go back and they'll go back. It takes them seven times leaving to actually get away from their trafficker. This past year, I didn't put it up, but this past year, um, they had, in Denver, they found a three-month-old and a five-year-old for sale for $600 on the internet. Now, again, we talked about these stats already. Top five states, California, Texas, Florida, Ohio, New York, Michigan, and I've seen it 13th, 2nd, and 5th. But again, if you looked for the asterisks explaining where they got those numbers, it doesn't exist. 
So be very careful when people are, are spouting off um, statistics. But we, like I said, understand that we are a prime location for it. Uh, Toledo is, is high because it's got all those hubs. Think of all those freeways that come right into Toledo. It's got a bus station, train station. It's got an airport. So easy in, easy out, which makes them very prime location for, getting, for moving bodies. Um, but we've got some of our own stuff here too, right? So if you want to do something, reporting or getting help, the National Human Trafficking Hotline, that 888-3737-888 uh, is 24-7, comes in 70 different languages. It's monitored in Washington, D.C. So this is a tip line. And you can go on the Polaris Project uh, website and you can look at where, where we've had some calls. Uh, our calls have increased about 16% in the state of Michigan. Uh, but these are calls, not, or tips, they're not cases. I know our AG's office has had five uh, convictions. We have a prosecutor in Lenawee County who has had seven convictions for human trafficking. We've had one here. But again, understand, I have to have a victim, right, that wants to, ha wants to come forward and testify against this trafficker. Could be a parent, could be somebody else. So they're very hard cases, and it takes a long time. So a lot of w that's why we don't have a lot of successful prosecutions yet, and we don't have a lot of people that are familiar with the laws and, and to help out. So sometimes they might reduce that charge to something else to get that person put, put away, but they may not charge and be able to charge you with that human trafficking. Uh, the Players Project, human uh, traffic free, uh, U.S. Department of Homeland Security, FBI. I'm gonna play a video, if you don't mind. Uh, this video was shot in Grand Rapids. I like using this video because this is what inspires me to do what I do. You just take a seat. All right. Thank you so much for coming in. I'm Mary, by the way. I'm Mary. Tonight. Tonight. Nice to meet nice you. Nice to meet you. Don't mind the giant microphone above your head. I'll try not. <laughs> there are three photos in front of you. If you could just pick one, it doesn't really matter which one it is, and show that one to us. All right. Could you describe her to us? She looks youthful. I feel like this is one of those situations where if I say he's 23, then he's actually going to be 16. <laughs> Hispanic, maybe not full, but part. Similar to me, actually. Well, I mean, she's young, so probably has a lot of things to look forward to. I would describe him as friendly. She looks, um, I don't know, happy. She doesn't look shy, but confident. Anything she puts her mind to, she could achieve. We actually have his story, if you could read that out loud to us. Okay, Marcus. I grew up really close to my parents. Adriana. I grew up with my brother and sister. Amy. I remember watching the Olympics on TV when I was five and being totally in awe of the sprinters. I was the middle child and easily the quietest. I felt like no one ever saw me or cared. Dad was too drunk to keep a job and he never even saw me unless I was in his way. Mom worked two jobs to make sure we had food for every meal, so she was never here to know when he would hit us. One day when I went to the mall, like I like to do to be out of the house, a man came up to me and told me I was beautiful and asked me on a date. On our first date, he drove me around in his car and said we could eat whatever I wanted. Every time we were together, he bought me something new. Tom really cared about me, and Tom really made me feel special. I was in love with him. After only going out for three weeks, Tom offered me a way out of my home, asked me to move in with him. So when he asked me to have sex with him, I did. He would put his hand over my face until I couldn't breathe. Tom had friends over pretty regularly, and I could tell that some of his friends were into me. So I kept my door locked and hoped that no one would bother me. After a few nights of crashing there, he said that I still owed him for letting me stay at his place. He said he had a friend who wanted to spend an hour with me. He told me I might have to do some stuff, but not to worry about it. It's not a big deal. When he didn't want to, he slapped me and said no one ever cared about me like he did. But I didn't know what else to do because I needed a place to stay. His friends forced themselves on me and took turns while he watched. One by one, they come down to the basement, telling me how pretty I am. When they're on top of me, I just close my eyes and pretend I'm running. I'm exhausted, and I don't know what to do. My name is Adriana, I'm 16 years old. My name is Marcus, I'm 14 years old. My name is Amy, I'm 12 years old. I live in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And I live in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And I live in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Okay. 
that was very different than what I thought. Especially because, like, being a girl and imagining, like, if that was me, like, that's... I don't even know. I can't even imagine what that would be like. She deserves to be a kid. Just like what she is in this picture. It being so close to home is something that makes me want to jump out of this chair. I wouldn't think that Grand Rapids is a place where anything like this would ever happen. Because you don't want it to happen to anybody and you really don't want it to happen to people that live where you live. Thank you for sharing her story with us. I'd like to show you something if you wouldn't mind taking her picture and following me to the gym. I expected uh, something certainly a lot smaller. Bar graphs and numbers and that this is, these are actual people. I don't know, in, in like my world, in my bubble or whatever, we don't talk about this. It's not something you think about. You know, what we see is only on the surface. I mean, looking at this, sex trafficking doesn't have any discrimination, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. Ages, genders, can affect anybody. It hits you right in your heart, your gut, your stomach. It's like, wow. Now it's like I feel like I have this weight of responsibility to see how I can help. Changes through greater awareness and making people realize that this does happen here and will continue to happen until we decide to make it stop. So that's why I do what I do. We do have uh, the Monroe County Anti-Human Trafficking Coalition does exist here in Monroe County. I'm the chair person for that. We do have a Facebook page. It's nothing short. You have to look up Monroe County Anti-Human Trafficking Coalition to get to it. But uh, we have postings for our meetings and events that are coming up. We will be having a human trafficking conference in October this year. So if anybody is interested in either joining the coalition or attending that conference, you can uh, go there for information. I appreciate. Do you have any questions for Tressa at this time? Yes, sir. Are they all any questions from home? She's got one. These people that are being trafficked, do they go to the houses of the traffickers? They can, yes. They or some. They go back home with them, or what happens when they? Some, like some people might be familiar with Teresa Flores, although she was trafficked years ago. Her trafficker, she lived at home, and she was 15 at the time, and there was a whole backstory to it. But they would call her and tell her to come on out here. So she'd sneak out of the house like 11 o'clock at night in like her pajamas, go meet these guys, they'd take her to somebody else's home, sell her there, and then bring her back home. So there's things that happen like that. There's things that if you are being trafficked by your own family members, yes, it's happening right in your own house. But there are people that obviously go to hotels, or motels, um, in cars, you know, because sometimes the girls are walking on the streets or the strip. Um, so it can happen anywhere, unfortunately. It would be an estimate again, and I'm not sure what the estimate in the, the most recent estimate is. Um, but I know we have about 274 million children in the uh, forced labor or in, in labor, uh, mostly overseas because we don't have as much of that here. But there's a lot of a lot of kids that are being trafficked in the labor industry. There is a human trafficking statute. It would it'd be a life, basically the 99 years. It's just h very hard to get to that in a, in a court of law. So they may reduce it to 
criminal sexual conduct, because they may reduce it to something else. Um, there are some, like the, the AG's <coughs> office that has had, had the five convictions, did, did convict them under the human trafficking statute. Uh, we have had 14 new bills passed in 2014, uh, 19 new bills passed in 2014, and we're working on 10 more, but still we're a long ways away from getting what we need. We don't have enough homes, we don't have enough places for these people to go to, be, to seek shelter or to seek counseling or to seek whatever they need. The services just aren't quite there yet. Some do end up in foster care. Um, some, like we do have a counseling group in Monroe County that's working with these ladies right now. We do have a couple uh, uh, church elders and church people that are actually working with them. Um, but there are other places too. That some of the homes that exist do have counseling, uh, both for religious counseling and other counseling. They have different types of things that these ladies are involved in to, to heal themselves. Because it takes, it's a long process. And it's, it's like an alcohol addiction or whatever. It's gonna take the rest of your life. It's not something you can just go to and live here for two weeks and you're, and you're all better. Um, because a lot of these people, again, Teresa Flores has told me time and time again, even though she's been out of the life 20 years now, she said, if my trafficker walked to that door and said, Teresa, come with me, she would go. Because he still has that much of a hold on her, no matter how much, how far she's come and, and she's identified it, they, they still have that, that hold. Now, if they're benefiting from it financially, it could be, yes. Mm -hmm. Tessa, thank you very much. Thank you. I really appreciate you being here, and I know it was informational for everybody at home and for everybody here, so thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, so at this time, uh, my longtime friend Stu Rickert uh, is here to kind of talk about um, his mission that he works with and how he brings awareness to this uh, as well. So uh, thank you very much, um, Paul, for having me. I appreciate everybody uh, here and appreciate people uh, watching on television. Uh, my name is Stu Rickert, and I'm with RPM Missions. It's actually a um, faith-based nonprofit organization that my wife and I began about five years ago uh, when we set out to um, actually uh, race go-karts. So my father was a race car driver back in Indianapolis, I never really got a chance to go racing. Uh, it wasn't anything I really wanted to take off my bucket list, but I did want to see how good I could have been in a, um, in a race car. Uh, no one was going to loan me a race car to race, so I had to end up with a race cart. And uh, so we set off racing, and before I did that, I thought, you know, all these race teams are always supporting some kind of cause. And I thought, you know, I prayed about it, and I asked, you know, I thought, I just prayed I, in my heart, what can I do beyond just racing and taking something off my bucket list? having my father come up from Sebring, Florida to uh, spend some time with me. What could I do in a positive way to maybe make sense of all this? And the answer in my heart was to raise some awareness for human trafficking and specifically for the Daughter Project. Now the Daughter Project is a home that just recently closed here in Wood County, unfortunately, because of financial problems, but it was Ohio's first licensed recovery home for those girls who had been rescued or escaped sex trafficking. And we're talking about minor girls. And we had a very good program. I was on the awareness committee for that. Maybe some of you know the uh, gentleman by the name of Jeff Wahlberger. He's from uh, Emanuel Baptist. He's a math teacher, but we should be really proud of Jeff. Uh, he's a very, very humble individual. He won the Jefferson National Award last year for his efforts on sex trafficking in this daughter project home. It remains closed right now, but it doesn't, that does not stop the need for these girls who have been rescued or escaped sex trafficking to have a place to go to to be able to find that holistic or that recovery that they need. And uh, we talked a little bit about all the counseling, and but there's everything from dental bills. I mean, the first day these girls are trafficked on the sidewalk, uh, that's probably the last day they're getting homeschooled. I mean, they're not getting homeschooled while they're being trafficked. They're not getting dental work. They're not getting the, medic you know, the medical attention that they need. Uh, we saw it on the slide there, one of the slides that affected me the most was that the average life expectancy for a girl on the street seven years. Why? Because there is so much supply of these girls that are not being loved by their fathers, maybe out of displaced homes or dysfunctional homes, runaways, drug addiction, um, whatever the case might be, there's enough supply there that these traffickers, they don't need to really worry about taking care of these girls at all. And that's why we have seven years to save them. 
Um, you know, these girls that cross over that line to where they're 18 years old, and now we sometimes want to label them as prostitutes. They were never prostitutes. They were just, they were, they were victims before we were able to recover them. They had their 18th birthday. And, th and these girls, uh, as we talked about, I mean, it's a lifetime of recovery. But those women that go through this kind of counseling to get past that Stockholm Syndrome, to get past the PTSDs and all the abuse and physical abuse and sexual abuse, they rise up and they become some of our best advocates. Uh, the, the survivors are the best. And I'm, unfortunately, we, don't, we did, weren't able to get a survivor here to speak with us, but maybe the next meeting that we have, we can actually let them speak to you because they, they could do a lot better job than I can. But my point on this whole deal is that we just need to get the word out. So my deal was, Stu, how can you bring awareness to whatever you're going to do to educate the grassroots level of racing? And maybe if you're able to do that, since um, you're being exposed in that racing culture, maybe we'll get a large race team, a stock car race team, or a um, professional Indy car team to pick up the banner. I mean, there are so many causes out there from hungry children to breast cancer to whatever. It's all you know, being promoted through racing, but yet we don't have any promotion of human trafficking. And as you saw, it's the largest criminal enterprise going today. I mean, it's, it's superseded drugs. And we talk about the people that are involved in this. You know, we've, we left out gangs. Gangs have realized how much of a cash cow, how much money they can generate off of trafficking. The gangs are now trafficking. And gangs are perfect because a lot of this trafficking and a lot of the, the girls and boys that come from this come from poverty situations. Why is Toledo what it is? The poverty level. Uh, was it wasn't too long ago that we were hitting 25%. We talked about the crossroads, but we talk also about dysfunctional or, or, uh, or homes that don't have fatherly figures. We talk about children that have never had that love, never had those compliments. All these pimps have to do is go out there, they see these girls, maybe with a drug dependent, or I say girls, these children, with drug dependency problems, they pick up on it just like that. They pick up on just the lost look, they pick up on the backpacks, they pick up on it at the malls, and they go up there and they just start asking a few questions and they find out what their love language is. Maybe it's gifts, maybe it's physical touch, maybe it's words of affirmation, maybe it's quality time. Whatever the love language is, they are all over that. And the girl at that point, what 13-year-old girl doesn't want to have you know, some kind of meaningful uh, quality time with, an, with, um, with somebody that she you know, respects or she believes that she is going to respect. So it's a pretty easy sell for those folks, for those pimps. Uh, I heard them call, I, I heard uh, them reference as bad guys. I like to reference them as predators for what they are. So our cause basically was to get out there and to raise awareness for the human trafficking problem, allow people to realize that there is a problem. Uh, we have a great opportunity as individuals to call that Polaris number that's on our banner here. We're trying to get 10,000 people to put that human trafficking hotline telephone number in their cell phone. If nothing more than to have that cell phone in their telephone so if they ever see something that they're suspected of, or suspected of and don't know exactly how to address it, that might be a house in your neighborhood that's being rented that you see cars going back and forth at all times of the night, but it's longer than a drug deal. Drug deals are usually five to seven minutes. Trafficking is usually 25 to 30 minutes, but it's always a change of cars. Well, what do you have in your neighborhood? I don't know. Maybe I should call the human trafficking hotline number and talk to one of the counselors and find out that I have a brothel in my neighborhood and that we need to get that closed down. And that happens everywhere. That happens everywhere. So if we have this human trafficking hotline number in our telephone, if we're sharing it with our children, if we're having conversations with our neighbors, conversations in churches, our, our business rotary meetings, et cetera, we are actually empowering ourselves to take our community back and to eradicate this, uh, to end slavery here. The, uh, honestly, we lost one of the best presidents of the United, the best president of the United States, I firmly believe that we ever had, Abraham Lincoln, over slavery back in 1865, and we're still battling this problem. So we just need to get out there, spread the word, put that telephone number in your cell phone, be deputized, don't rely on Paul to call because you're gonna continue driving. If it's in your heart, and you saw something that you need to have a question answered, then you need to make the call. If it's something very obvious, as if a trafficker is pushing or shoving or beating or whatever, putting somebody in a, in a van, then that's a 911 call. And that's get the license plate number and call immediately. But we can, we can do something about this and we can step up and take our communities back and just make this place better. So that's what we're doing through racing. You know, actually I'm probably a better promoter of, or a better 
um, person raising awareness for human trafficking and providing the preventative message, which we're going to talk a little bit about the internet and how vulnerable our children are there, then I am racing. But I would not have given up these last five years for anything in the world. We have had so many conversations, some, pos some great conversations, success stories. We don't care what the statistics are, the numbers. Uh, you know, if we can save one or 1,000 lives, then it's a victory, right? That's all we need to do is to save one person's life. And back to the recovery homes, with the uh, Daughter Project home, that full recovery home, I've heard from the task force that our focus almost needs to be 18 hours after these girls or boys are rescued. And uh, again, believe me, the boys end up in pornography industry as well as the women as well. Pornography, we can talk a little bit about the internet driving a lot of this. But we just actually need homes that maybe cater to these uh, victims that have been uh, rescued or escaped within the first 18 hours. That's what the FBI task force is saying. So somehow or another, if we could find these short-term homes to get these girls not to go back out and for seven different times be brought back in before they finally realize that this, uh, you know, there's a better answer. So that's about it. RPM missions, we have a Facebook. I'd love for you to just uh, jump up there, take a look at our uh, recent video. Uh, always looking for volunteers. We just want to get people to get out there and to uh, just be a participant in ending this. And Paul, I thank you very much for your time. Yeah, and I appreciate the audience as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stu. Go ahead, Stacy. Thank you. <laughs> Great presentation so far. I have two daughters of my own. I've never heard of the Daughter Project, so this is great awareness for myself and everyone in this community. My name is Stacy Demers. I'm with the Bedford Advanced Cybersecurity Development Center, Bedford ACDC for short. And I just have some quick information to share about our efforts that tie into human trafficking. Um, as Trooper Tressa had mentioned that a lot of the rec recruiting happens online. So we are um, working with the, s the area schools and the Monroe County Community College to bring in digital empowerment classes. These will be presentations for parents and educators on multiple subjects such as the role of the parent, um, complexity of the digital world, the dangers of the digital world, teen stress factors online, open communication with your children. Um, there'll be presentations for students as well on sexting, privacy, digital respect, dangers online, um, using the internet safely, empowering your, your friends to recognize the dangers and use the internet safety as well. Um, we were also in talks with the Human Trafficking and Social Justice Institute at the University of Toledo. Our chairman just had a, a meeting with them today to try to get more training and courses out of our center to have more training locally on, on the subject. So we also have a Facebook page to follow. Um, please like our page and as more programs develop, we will be posting that information online on our Facebook page. Cool. Well, thank you very much for being here. Um, we've got about one minute, and I've got to wrap this thing up. The bottom line is, is our kids don't know what's best for them. Our teenagers don't. So us parents, we got to get involved, know what's going on. This computer, it, it can be a really good tool and a really bad one. So I really appreciate everybody <coughs> being here tonight and, um, you know, share this information. Put the phone number in your phone. Um, if no further questions, we stand adjourned.